An integrated theory of everything video presentation, if you Google an integrated theory of everything and my name, Antonio A. Colella, you will find on the internet the article upon which the presentation is based. I've also written a book called Master Big Bangs Through Black Holes in Four Hours, An Integrated Theory of Everything Introduction. That will be available late January 2013 from Amazon.com in either hard copy or electronic format. An integrated theory of everything unites all known physical phenomena from the infinitely small at the Planck cube scale to the infinitely large at the super universe scale. Each of 129 fundamental matter and force particles resides within a Planck cube as a string and any object in the super universe, such as an encyclopedia or the entire super universe can be defined by volumes of contiguous Planck cubes, which contain these fundamental matter or force particle strings. Super force string singularities existed at the center of Planck cubes at the start of the super universe or precursor universes and all universes, including our universe. The integrated theory of everything foundations are 20 independent existing theories, and they include string theory, particle creation, inflation, spontaneous symmetry breaking, the Higgs forces, supersymmetric Higgs particles, dark matter, dark energy, the super universe, stellar black holes, and baryogenesis. Each existing theory was selectively amplified. For example, I made particle creation and inflation time synchronous. Without sacrificing the independent existing theories integrities, they were replaced by 20 interrelated amplified theories. And the output is the integrated theory of everything. I will show that to you as table four, which is the final chart in the presentation. In string theory, the Calabian membrane or the string's energy mass is defined by three parameters. The hills and valleys amplitude, displacement, and frequency are used for the 129 individual particles. And the diameter parameter, which is an amplification to string theory, is used to describe the singularity. There are 129 individual particles. There are 16 standard model particles. Each of those 16 has one of 16 supersymmetric uh, partners. Each of the first 32 have one of 32 antiparticles. And each of the first 64 have one of 64 supersymmetric Higgs particles. There is a superforce, which is the mother particle to the remaining 128. The 64 supersymmetric Higgs are an amplification to Higgs theory. A Calabian membrane which just touches a Planck cube, in other words, a perfect sphere which just touches the six sides of a Planck cube, represents zero energy mass, and an example of that would be the photon. The energy mass is proportional to the hills and valleys, amplitude, displacement, and frequency. So if you put a small amount of amplitude and frequency modulation, you can uh, simulate the up quark, which has an energy mass of two mega electron volts. If you put more amplitude and frequency modulation, you can represent the top quark. And if you put even more amplitude and frequency modulation, you can represent the super partners, which have energies between 100 and 1500 giga electron uh, volts. Our universe's Big Bang singularity consists of superimposed superforce uh, particle strings, and that singularity is a rotating charge donut-shaped singularity at the center of a single Planck cube. It is also a Kerr-Newman black hole, as I will point out in the presentation. This singularity was caused by the collapse of a super, supermass of quark star matter to a super, super mass of black hole energy in our precursor universe, and that represented the transfer from the precursor universe to our universe. 
This donut-shaped singularity has a near-infinite energy mass of 10 to the 54th kilograms, which is the energy mass of our universe, and that's a, equivalent to 10 to the 24th uh, solar masses or 10 to the 90th electron volts. The string diameter is inversely proportional to the energy mass. What that means is at the start of our universe, we had a very small donut-shaped singularity at the center of a Planck cube. At the start of the super universe, the super universe is 10 to the 120th more energetic than our universe. The singularity at the center of the super universe was much, much smaller than the donut shaped singularity of our universe. And the reason being is the string diameter is inversely proportional to the energy mass. This chart shows the proposed standard and supersymmetric particle symbols. On the left side are the standard model. On the right side are the supersymmetric. There are four force particles in the standard model. They are the graviton, the gluon, the WZ boson, and the photon. There are 12 matter particles. They consist of six quarks and six leptons. Over on the right side, we have the supersymmetric uh, matter and force particles. There are four supersymmetric matter particles, the gravitino, the gluino, the winozino, and the photino. And there are 12 force particles, and they are the six squarks and six leptons. Now, the subscript uniquely defines a particular matter and force particle, for example, 11 stands for the up quark, and 16, P16, is the photon force particle. If you add 16 to the basic subscript, you find the super partner. So if P11 is the up quark matter particle, if you add 16 to the 11, you get P27, and the, that's the up squark force particle. Similarly, if P16 is the photon force particle, if you add 16 to that, you get P32, which is the photino matter particle. If you add the word BAR to the subscript, you find the antiparticle. So for example, P11 BAR is the anti-up quark. And most importantly, if you change the P with an H, you find this supersymmetric Higgs particle associated with the matter or force particle. So if P11 is the up quark matter particle, H11 is the Higgs force associated with the up quark. If P16 is the photon force particle, H16 is the Higgsino, or Higgs matter particle associated with the uh, photon. Now why did I reinvent the wheel? These symbols already exist as existing symbols, for example, my up quark, P11, is denoted by a U in existing symbols. My up squark, P27, is a U with a tilde over it. My P11 bar, B-A-R, the anti-up quark, that's denoted by a U with a bar over it. And my P16, the photon, in the existing symbols, is a gamma. The reason why I went to the proposed symbols is the existing symbols are inadequate for an integrated theory of everything. And there are two reasons for that. Existing symbols do not have explicit Higgs particles, and existing symbols have many ambiguities which can be eliminated via subscript and capitals. The first example. In the presentation, I will point out that there are eight permanent matter particles, the up quark, the down quark, the electron, the electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino, and two dark matter particles, the xeno and photino. Each of those eight permanent matter particles has a Higgs force energy associated with it, and the sum of the eight Higgs force energies associated with those eight permanent matter particles is dark energy. Each of these uh, matter particles, for example, P11 has an H11, uh, P32, the photino, has an H32. Explicit Higgs particles do not exist in the present sim uh, symbology. The second reason for going to the proposed uh, 
particle symbols. There were many ambiguities in the existing symbols which can be eliminated via standardization of subscripts and capital. For example, P2, the gluon, I subdivide that into P2A, P2B, all the way to P2H to explicitly define the eight types of gluons in the universe. In the existing symbology, I have not seen any explicit symbol for the eight gluons. An even better example of that is uh, P16, the photon. I take the P16 and divide it into uh, P16A for electromagnetic radi radiation and P16B into force carrying photons. Furthermore, I take the P16A and I subdivide that into P16A1 for gamma rays, P16A2 for X-rays, all the way down to the electromagnetic spectrum. In the current symbols, gamma is ambiguously used for all of electromagnetic radiation and gamma ray radiation. There are no specific symbols for X-rays, uh, FM, AM uh, electromagnetic radiation, and there is no symbol for a force-carrying photon. Another example is uh, PSFP11. That stands for the superforce, which condenses into P11, the up quark. When I talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking, I will describe 17 different types of superforce. In the existing symbols, there is only one type of superforce. The next example is capital P11. That stands for the total energy mass of all the up quarks in our universe. And by total energy uh, mass, I mean rest mass energy, I mean kinetic energy, translational and rotational, and potential energy. That's gravitational, electromagnetic, or nuclear binding energy. Nowhere have I seen the total energy mass in the existing symbols for the up quark, the down quark, and the photino. And that's essential, and I will show that to you in the next chart when I talk about the Big Bang. And lastly, there's a capital PSFD, which stands for superforce density, P P11, which condenses to P11. When I talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking, I will describe 17 spontaneous symmetry breaking functions, uh, one for each of those 17 matter particles, eight permanent and nine transient. Now, this is the Big Bang timeline from t equals zero to uh, 200 seconds. You will notice that all of the symbols are capital letters. We're talking about the total energy mass and the superforce in the up quark and the down quark and in the uh, photinos. At time t equals zero, all of the energy of our universe was in this donut-shaped singularity at the center of a single Planck cube and the energy mass equal 10 to the 54th kilograms. By 100 seconds after the Big Bang, or at the end of matter creation, that superforce had been condensed into eight permanent matter particles, the up quark, the down quark, the electron, electron, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino, the xeno, and photino. And associated with those eight permanent matter particles were eight permanent Higgs force energies, and the sum of those eight was dark energy. So by 100 seconds after the Big Bang, the composition of our universe had been established. 4.6% was in baronic uh, matter, 22.8% uh, was in dark matter, and 726 was in dark energy. And furthermore, the, those percentages did not vary from 100 seconds after the Big Bang to uh, the present time, which is 13.7 uh, billion years after the Big Bang. Now, the start of matter creation, as I said before, I made the start of matter creation time synchronous with the inflationary period. At this particular time, we had a single Planck cube, and in that Planck cube was all the energy of the universe. And if you attach six Planck cubes to the six faces of that center Planck cube, you get what I call the one to seven uh, Planck cube energy to matter transformation. At the start of matter creation, some of the energy in that center Planck cube condensed out into six matter particles and those six adjoining Planck cubes. When that was done, that first shell was pushed out. Another set of matter particles was created. 
When that was done, it was pushed out, and a third shell of matter particles was created. Uh, this went on for a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, and by that time, the universe had uh, expanded from the size of a Planck cube at the beginning of inflation to the size of a sphere with an eight meter radius at the end of inflation. At that time, we had enough Planck cubes to accommodate all the matter particles in the universe. And at that time, we had a hot quark gluon plasma that had a temperature of 10 to the 25th degree Kelvin. Going over to the individual time, that 5.4 times 10 to the minus 44th, the graviton condensed out from the superforce in that center Planck cube. Along with the graviton was its superpartner, the gravitino, and associated with both of those were the supersymmetric Higgs particles associated with it. At t equal uh, 10 to the minus 36 seconds, we had the uh, super uh, the unified theory where the strong force uh, was combined with the electromagnetic force, uh, which was combined with the weak force. At this particular time, the strong force, the gluon, condensed out from the uh, grand unified the theory, along with its super part of the gluino and their two supersymmetric Higgs particles. At t equal 10 to the minus 12 per seconds, we had the electroweak force uh, that broke up into two parts, the electromagnetic force, which is the photons, and the weak force, which is the WZ boson. Associated with both of those were their super partners, and associated with those four are the four supersymmetric Higgs particles. And lastly, at the time less than 10 to the minus 36 seconds, we had 12 super partner forces. Uh, these were basically X bosons or inflatons. The X bosons or inflatons were uh, to the expansion of the universe during the inflationary period just as those eight Higgs force energies or dark energy were to the expansion of the universe from the end of inflation to the present time. Uh, this chart shows the radius of the observed universe uh, versus the time after the Big Bang. Uh, as I said, I started inflation when the size of the universe was the size of a Planck cube or when the radius of the universe was 0.8 times 10 to the minus 35th meters. Within a very short period of time, namely within a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, the universe expanded from the size of a Planck cube at this point to a spherical universe with a radius of eight meters at the end of inflation. And at that time, we had a hot quark gluon plasma. The exponential inflation factor is 10 to the 36th. This shot was taken from a Dr. Guth's book, An Inflationary Universe, with the uh, amplification that inflation was time synchronous with particle creation. If you read his book, his exponential inflation factor is 10 to the 49th. If you read Little and Lyle's book, they claim that the basic uh, inflation rate has to be greater than 10 to the 26th. So my 10 to the 36th was greater than the minimum specified by Little and Lyle, uh, but it was less than the 10 to the 49th as proposed by Dr. Guth. And the reason for that is I started inflation when the size of the universe was the size of a Planck cube, and Dr. Guth started it when the size of the universe was much smaller. The Higgs force is key to an integrated theory of everything, and therefore I have the following amplification of Higgs forces. First, the Higgs force is a residual superforce. When the superforce condenses to a matter particle such as an up quark, what's left over is the residual superforce, and that is the Higgs force. The Higgs force contains the mass, charge, and spin of the associated matter particle. Matter particles and their associated Higgs forces are one and inseparable. The example I use is an underweight porcupine with overgrown spine. 
The underweight porcupine is, for example, an, an upquark matter particle inside a plant cube, and the overgrown spines are the three-dimensional Higgs force field which are permanently attached to that matter particle. No matter where the matter particle goes, the Higgs force goes with it. They are one and inseparable. You cannot have a matter particle without the Higgs force and vice versa. Superforce condenses into 17 matter particles and there are 17 associated Higgs forces at 17 different temperatures. It's very similar to the three-phase cooling from steam to water to ice, except it's the superforce that's being condensed into those 17 different matter particles and there are 17 associated Higgs forces. Spontaneous symmetry breaking is bidirectional. When I talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking, I will describe the superforce condensing into a matter particle and its associated Higgs force. Later in the presentation, I will describe a super, super massive quark star matter, which consists of those eight permanent matter particles and their associated Higgs forces. At the proper energy mass threshold, each of those matter particles and their associated Higgs forces evaporates up to the superforce, and that super, super massive quark star matter collapses to a super, super massive black hole energy, which is that donut-shaped singularity. And that was the input to our universe. The false vacuum state is an intermediate state. This is where you have switching between the superforce energy and either transient matter particles or particles and any particles. There are nine transient matter particles, the top quark, the bottom quark, the charm quark, the strange quark, the muon, the tau, the gravitino, the gluino, and the WZ boson. The WZ boson is a transient matter particle. It is not a boson, as I will describe in one of the subsequent charts. The true vacuum state is a permanent state. This is the space between matter or the lowest energy temperature density. When our universe was 100 seconds old, everything in the universe had a uniform temperature of 10 to the 10th degree Kelvin. That is all the matter particles and the Higgs forces uh, between the matter particles. At the present time, the matter particles have lumped together into stars, galaxies, and filaments, and they're at a fairly high temperature, whereas the space between them is almost at zero degrees, it's at 2.73 degrees Kelvin. The vacuum or dark energy density equals the sum of eight permanent Higgs force particles, energy densities, or dark energy density is the density of the Higgs force associated with the tau neutrino, the down quark, the up quark, the electron, muon neutrino, electron neutrino, the xeno, and the photino. The cosmological constant lambda is proportional to the vacuum or dark energy density, or the cosmological constant is a constant times dark energy density. The cosmological constant is not a constant. And the reason for that is our universe, as it expands, the amount of dark energy is a constant. But as it expands, the dark energy density decreases with time. And since the cosmological constant is proportional to dark energy density. The cosmological constant is slowly decreasing variable with time. Dark matter is a neutralino, which is an amalgam of two superpartner matter particles, the xeno and the photino. This is the up-quark spontaneous symmetry breaking function. The z-axis is energy density, or in my terminology, that would be capital P, SFD, superforce density, P11, which condenses into P11. The x-axis is the Higgs force associated with a single up-quark. The y-axis is the Higgs force associated with a single any up-quark. There are two key positions of the ball. When the ball is in the peak position, none of the superforce energy density has condensed to matter particles. And when the ball is in the position shown, all the superforce energy has condensed to the matter particle and its associated Higgs force. 
Now, the detailed operation is as follows. The ball starts at the peak position and initially comes down midway between the X and Y axis. What is happening there is the super force is condensing in equal amounts into the up quark and its associated Higgs force and into the anti-up quark and its associated Higgs force. Those two particles, or those four particles evaporate back to the super force and the ball goes back to the uh, peak position. That is different than the explanation in the current literature which says that an up quark annihilates with an anti-up quark and it goes to gamma, whatever this parameter gamma is. What I'm saying is there are four particles, the up quark and its Higgs force, the anti-up quark and its Higgs force, the four particles annihilate and evaporate back to the super force. On the next the cycle, the ball comes down closer to the x-axis than to the y-axis. Once again, those four particles evaporate back to the super force. And after n of these condensation evaporation cycles, the ball comes down to the position shown here. And what has happened in that case is the super force has condensed totally into the up quark and its associated Higgs force, and none of the super force has condensed to the anti-up quark and its associated Higgs force. The process I just described is baryogenesis for the up quark. I will say more about this in a later chart, but suffice it to say that the reason why it happens is because of CPT charge parity time violation. And the reason why th that occurs is because the super force is in a volume smaller than a Planck cube, and the Planck cube is the basic uh, unit of uh, matter, force, and space. And when that super force condenses to an up quark, which is in a Planck cube, quantum mechanics is invalid because the super force is in a volume smaller than the basic uh, quantum or Planck uh, cube. Now, it takes a fraction of a second for the ball to go from the peak position to its position here. And what happens at that time, the ball goes vertically down and it takes 13.7 billion years for that ball to reach its current position, which is just over the vacuum circle for up quarks. Once again, during the last 13.7 billion years, the Higgs force associated with the up quark has remained constant. Now, as I said previously, there are 17 of these spontaneous symmetry breaking functions, one for each of those eight permanent matter particles, one for each of the nine transient particles. They have the same generic sombrero hat shape, but there are two key differences. The intercept or the peak position on the z-axis is different between the up quark, the down quark, and the photino, and uh, the uh, ball position shown here is different uh, for the uh, three particles. For example, the Higgs force associated with the up quark is different than the Higgs force associated with the down quark, which is different than the Higgs force associated with the uh, Fotino. There are three types of uh, matter particles that go through spontaneous symmetry breaking. The first is a type one matter particle these are the 17 standard and supersymmetric particles, which I just described on the previous chart. And they occur during uh, the uh, matter creation occurs between the start of inflation and the end of matter creation at 100 seconds after the Big Bang. The highest temperature, 10 to the 27th, is for the heaviest energy mass particle, the gravitino. The, lowest temperature, 10 to the 10th degree Kelvin, is for the lightest energy mass particle, the electron neutrino. Each of those 17 uh, matter uh, particles has a unique condensation temperature between uh, the range of 10 to the 27th and 10 to the 10th. The second type of matter particle are the three standard model hexenos, which are associated with three standard model force particles such as the graviton, the gluon, and the photon. What happens there is the ball starts at the peak position and it comes down until it reaches a point where the Mexican hat intersects the XY plane. And the description of that is all a super force particles energy is condensed to a hexeno matter particle 
and none to the associated force particle because the graviton, the gluon, and the photon each have zero energy mass. The Large Hadron Collider searching for composite Higgs force as a point the particle. As I said before, the Higgs force is not a point particle. It's a three-dimensional field, the overgrown spines of the underweight porcupine, and uh, therefore it is not a point particle. What the Large Hadron Collider may be detecting is a type 2 Higgs xenomatter point particle and not the Higgs force. The third type of matter particle are the 12 supersymmetric hexenos associated with the 12 squarks and sleptons, which as I mentioned before were the X bosons or inflatons. Here the ball starts at the peak position and it comes to an undefined point between the maximum and minimum values on the ZX plane. Uh, and therefore what's happening is the superforce is condensing to both hexenos and to X bosons. The X bosons or inflatons are to the expansion of the universe during the inflationary period as the Higgs forces or the dark energy is to the expansion of the universe following inflation and up to the present time. And lastly, an undefined subset of 15 Higgsinos should be included as dark matter. There are three types of condensation evaporation of matter particles. Uh, two of them I've uh, described already. In the first type, the heavier particles decay to lighter particles and the intermediate force particles, the WZ boson. And the best example of that is beta decay, which is described as follows. The down quark decays to an up quark and the W minus boson, and then the W minus boson decays to an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. Now at best, the beta decay equations are ambiguous. At worst, they're incorrect. And the reason for that is we're splitting fundamental matter particles. It appears that we're taking a down quark and we have a cleaver and we're splitting the down quark into two parts into an up quark and into a W minus boson. The assumption I made is you cannot split fundamental matter particles and therefore, my beta decay, which is an amplification, it's addition of the Higgs forces to the equation, and it involves the division of energy, not fundamental matter particles. So now the equation is as follows. The down quark, which consists of the down quark matter particle and its associated Higgs force, both of those evaporate to the superforce. Now you have energy. That energy is easily subdivided into two parts. One part condenses into the up quark matter particle and its associated Higgs force, and the second into the W minus boson matter particle and its associated Higgs force. The W minus boson is a transient matter particle, not a boson, because in 10 to the minus 25 seconds after its creation, the W minus boson matter particle and its Higgs force evaporate to the superforce. And now you have energy, and that superforce condenses into two parts, one part into the electron and its associated Higgs force, and the second part into the anti-electron neutrino and its associated Higgs force. Particles and antiparticles I described as baryogenesis in the early universe. What I said there was initially the superforce condensed into equal amounts into an up quark and its associated Higgs force and an anti-up quark and its associated Higgs force. Those four particles uh, evaporated back to the superforce and after n of these condensation evaporation cycles, uh, the ball eventually came down to where the superforce uh, condensed totally into the up quark and its associated Higgs force and none of the energy to the uh, any up quark and its associated Higgs force. Now the third type of condensation of operation is the super supermassive quark star matter in our precursor universe, which evaporated, deflated, and collapsed to a black hole energy. And that super supermassive quark star matter consisted of those eight permanent matter particles and their associated Higgs forces. And at the proper energy mass threshold, 
the super, super mass of quarks don't matter, evaporated, deflated, and collapsed to a black hole energy, which is the donut-shaped singularity. The super universe consists of a multiverse, which is, consists of parallel precursor universes and parallel universes. Our universe is nested within a much, much larger precursor universe, which is nested within a much, much larger super universe. The super universe is 10 to the 120th the size of our universe. Universal laws of physics apply. I've assumed that the same 129 matter and force particles are present throughout the super universe. The law of conservation of energy mass is obeyed throughout the super universe. And the amount of dark energy in the super universe is 72.6% of the total energy mass, and that's the same as it is in our universe. Stellar black hole theory was amplified to include a quark star matter. And the reason why I did that, there was an inconsistency between the definition of singularity and maximum entropy. On the one hand, they described the black hole having a singularity, which has minimum area, minimum volume, and on the other hand, they said that this black hole had maximum entropy, which is proportional to area or volume, and that implies a maximum area and maximum volume. So the amplification was as follows. The neutron star collapses first to a quark star matter, and then at the proper energy mass threshold, it collapses to a black hole energy or this donut-shaped singularity. Both the quark star matter and the black hole energy are black, you cannot see them, and they have identical energy masses. Now what is the difference between the two? A quark star matter has mass, it has those eight permanent matter particles, it has volume, it has near zero temperature, it has high, in fact maximum entropy, and it has permanence. In contrast, a black hole energy has no mass, consists of the uh, superforce particle, it has minimum volume, that donut-shaped singularity. It has near-infinite temperature, 10 to the 94th degree Kelvin for our universe. It has minimum entropy, and it has transientness. Our precursor universe is super, super massive quark star matter, evaporated, deflated, collapsed to a black hole energy at the 10 to the 24th uh, solar mass threshold, which is the energy of our universe. And this created the universe's Big Bang white hole. It transferred total energy mass via the conservation of energy. The super, super mass of quark star matter had the same energy mass as the super, super mass of black hole energy, and that had the same energy mass as our universe, and all three equal 10 to the 54 kilograms of energy. The quark star matter deflation was similar to the Big Bang inflation. It was approximately twice as long as inflation, as I will describe on a subsequent chart. And entropy transformed from maximum in the super, super massive quark star matter case to minimum in the super, super massive black hole energy case, in effect resurrecting life via creation of the super force or the mother particle. In our universe, the entropy increased by the second law of thermodynamics. There are approximately 100 billion galaxies in our universe, and each one of those galaxies has approximately 100 billion stars. The entropy decreased in the subset volume of our universe, namely where our solar system was located. Low entropy is synonymous with life, high entropy with death or unavailable energy. The entropy decreased in our solar system was less than the universe's entropy increase among the remaining 10 to the 22nd stars. And therefore, the fact that we had decrease in entropy in our solar system did not negate the second law of thermodynamics for our universe. There was a similar argument for our precursor universe. Once again, the entropy increased via the second law of thermodynamics. The entropy decreased in a subset volume, namely the volume where that super, super mass of quark star matter, black hole energy, was created. 
the subset volume was much, much smaller than the precursor uni universe in volume, and therefore the second law of thermodynamics was not violated in our precursor universe. For a super supermassive quark star matter with a mass of 10 to the 23 solar masses, the Hawking temperature is near zero. It's 10 to the minus 30 degrees Kelvin, and the approximate lifetime is near infinite, 10 to the 135th years. As the super supermassive quark star matter accumulated mass, the mass and lifetime approach near infinite, and the temperature approach zero. However, something magical happened during the super supermassive quark star matter black hole energy evaporation deflation collapse. The values flipped. The mass and lifetime went to zero, and the temperature approached near infinite. There was a time symmetry between the quark star matter black hole energy and the white hole quark gluon plasma that I will show you on the next page. And this is in accordance with Einstein's theory of general relativity. Now this is the quark star black hole of our precursor universe to the Big Bang of our universe transition. The y-axis represents the number of superforce particles. The x-axis is plus or minus time from the Big Bang or time t equals zero. There's a basic symmetry uh, between the two sides of the uh, figure. At this hash mark, we have a time of minus 10 to the minus 33 seconds. And at this hash mark, we have a time of 10 to minus 33 seconds. Now, at time t equals zero, we had this donut-shaped singularity consisted of superimposed superforced particle strings, and nothing happened until the start of matter creation. And as I described, we went through that one to seven Planck cube energy to matter transformation. And at this point, some of the superforced energy started to condense into those heaviest matter particles, the gravitino and the gluino. By the end of inflation, or within a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, the universe had expanded from the size of a Planck cube here to a spherical universe with a radius of eight meters, and that had a temperature of 10 to the 25th degree Kelvin. It was also known as a hot quark gluon plasma. During the remaining portion of matter creation, the lightest uh, matter particles will form the permanent, the eight permanent matter particles will form uh, along with their eight permanent Higgs force energies, which was dark energy. Now going over to the left side of the diagram, at one second before the Big Bang, we had a super, super massive quark star matter. Its temperature was near zero, 10 to the minus 30 degrees Kelvin. I've estimated the size of the super, super massive quark star as approximately the size of our Milky Way galaxy. In other words, a spherical volume having a radius of approximately 50,000 light years. At the start of matter evaporation, the following happened. At the center of that super, super massive quark star matter was a single electron neutrino and its associated Higgs force. And those, that particle had the weight or pressure of all the matter particles in our universe on it and that pressure translated to temperature. So even though the temperature of the super, super mass of quark star matter was near zero, at the center, the temperature was raised to 10 to the 10th degree Kelvin, and that evaporated that electron neutrino and its associated Higgs force. At that time, the center of the super, super mass of quark star matter temperature increased incrementally. And that started a chain reaction such that within less than a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, that super, super massive quark star went from a cold quark gluon plasma at zero degree temperature and the size, approximately the size of our Milky Way galaxy to a hot quark gluon plasma had a temperature of 10 to the 25th degree Kelvin and it had a radius of eight meters. 
During the second deflation phase, that was the counterpart of inflation. What happened there is the heavier matter particles and their associated Higgs forces evaporated back to the super force. And by the end of the matter evaporation, we had this donut-shaped singularity consisting of super force particles, which was transferred over to our universe, which started our Big Bang. Now this chart shows the justification of the precursor universe. We have the three laws of physics in the first column. We have the ultimate free lunch theory, which is the prevailing theory of cosmology in the second column. And we have an integrated theory of everything, which is a, an alternative to the ultimate free lunch theory in the third column. The conservation of energy mass is violated by the ultimate free lunch theory, and the reason for that, in the ultimate free lunch theory, nothing existed before time t equals zero, or more precisely, only random fluctuations or noise existed before time t equals zero. At time t equals zero, miraculously, uh, all the energy in our universe, 10 to the 54th kilograms, was created. And uh, this is the reason for the name, the ultimate free lunch theory. From nothing, we uh, achieved all the energy mass in our universe. In contrast, an integrated theory of everything, there was a super, super mass of quarks to matter, which had the same energy mass as the super, super mass of black hole energy, which had the same energy mass at the start of our universe. So that obeys the conservation of energy mass. Einstein's theory of general relativity states there's a black hole which swallows matter and energy. There is a white hole which expels matter and energy, the white hole of our Big Bang. And between them, there's an Einstein-Rosen bridge, also known as a wormhole, also known as that donut-shaped singularity. The ultimate free lunch violates Einstein's theory of relativity because before time t equals zero, there was nothing but noise or random fluctuation. In contrast, an integrated theory of everything did include the super, super mass of black hole of our precursor universe. It included the white hole, which is the Big Bang of our universe, and it included the Einstein-Rosen bridge, which is that donut-shaped singularity between the two universes. The second law of thermodynamics is satisfied by the ultimate free lunch. It's also satisfied by an integrated theory of everything. What I said previously was we had a very, very large precursor universe. And relative to that, there was a very small subvolume which contained the super, super massive quarks to matter, black hole energy. And even though the entropy decreased in that small volume, it was outweighed by the volume of the total precursor universe. The cosmological constant problem was that it was 10 to the minus 120th of the expected value. And the reason was that the super universe was 10 to the 120th the size of our universe. The super universe consists of nested universe. Our universe is nested within a much larger precursor universe, which is, nest, which is nested within a much larger super universe. The dark energy density is a constant of time t, and it's uniformly distributed throughout the super universe, all precursor universes, and all universes, including our universe. The super universe expands via eternal inflation. The amount of dark energy in the super universe is a constant. As the super universe expands, the dark energy density decreases as a function of time. In our precursor universe, there was a subset volume that formed this super, super massive quark star matter black hole energy. And as I stated, the quark star matter evaporated, deflated, and collapsed to the black hole energy, or that donut-shaped singularity. The black hole energy was surrounded by a spherical perfect vacuum because when the matter particles and the Higgs forces evaporated, there was nothing left. And therefore, we had a black hole energy or donut-shaped singularity 
that had a temperature of 10 to the 94 degree Kelvin, and that was surrounded by a perfect vacuum, zero degree Kelvin, and that's what caused the transition to the white hole and the creation of matter and force particles in our universe. Currently, there is a spherical perfect vacuum shell between the outer boundary of our universe and the inner boundary of our precursor universe. The super universe's radius is approximately 10 to the 50th light years. Spherical volumes are proportional to the radii cube. So if you multiply the radius of our universe by this 10 to the 40th, you get the radius of the super universe. The super universe's age was approximately 10 to the 50th years. What I assumed was that the age of the super universe was to the radius of the super universe as the age of our universe was to the radius of our universe. In other words, equal expansion rates. If you multiply the numbers through, you get an age of 10 to the 50th years. Now this shows the nested universes at four different Big Bang times. At a time t equal minus 10 to the 50th year, we have the super universes Big Bang. Once again, this was a donut-shaped singularity at the center of a single Planck cube. By time t equal minus 15 billion years, that donut-shaped singularity had evolved into the super universe. At that time, there was a super, super mass of black hole, donut-shaped singularity, that was formed. And over the next 15 billion years, it formed our precursor universe. And as I've been describing all along, at time t equals zero, there was a super, super massive black hole, which over the next 13.7 billion years uh, became or evolved into our universe. Now on the diagram, I show a parallel universe that had a finite size at time t equals zero. What that meant is that parallel universe was formed before time t equals zero. Over the next 13.7 billion years, that parallel universe has evolved into the larger parallel universe. The super universe is explicitly shown at this time. Our precursor universe is explicitly shown at this time. The super universe and our precursor universe are implicit at the present time. You must remember that our universe and the parallel universe are nested within a much larger precursor universe, and that's nested within a much larger super universe. There are three types of stellar objects superimposed on the celestial sphere. There are stars within the Milky Way galaxy, there are galaxies within our universe, and then there are galaxies within the super universe. The Milky Way galaxy can be approximated by a spherical volume which has a radius of 50,000 light years. The stars are not uniformly distributed. If you look at the Milky Way, they're con concentrated in a band overhead. The reason for that is our Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy, and we're looking at the stars edge on. However, to the left and to the right of this overhand band of stars, or additional stars in the Milky Way galaxy, so you can approximate the Milky Way galaxy by a spherical volume. Our universe consists of a true spherical volume. It has a radius of 46.5 billion light years. There are 100 billion galaxies uniformly distributed in our universe, and what that means is if you have a cube which has a side of 300 million light years, and you move it anywhere in our universe, you will measure the same amount of boronic and dark matter no matter where that cube is located in our universe. The Hubble Ultra Deep Telescope is currently measuring galaxies as far away as 13.1 billion years. That is almost to the edge of our universe, which is 13.7 billion years. In the future, the James Webb Telescope will be able to measure galaxies that are 13.4 billion years old, hopefully we will detect those first generation stars, the population of three stars, and their collapse to neutron stars or quark stars matter. 
The superuniverse is a spherical volume. It has a 10 to the 50th light year radius. And there are 10 to the 120th parallel universes uniformly distributed in the superuniverse. We need an advanced telescope to detect the closest galaxy in the closest parallel universe or a galaxy which is beyond the 13.7 billion boundary uh, of our universe. The black hole information paradox is as follows. In 1975, Hawkins stated that radiation contained no information swallowed by the black hole. In 2004, its position reversed and re radiation contained information. I am in agreement with his first statement. I disagree with the present statement. The no hair theorem states for black hole energy, the donut shaped singularity, has three information parameters, mass, charge, and spin. And in contrast, our universe contains near infinite information. Any object, for example, in encyclopedia's intrinsic information consists of the relative orientation of the up quark, down quark, and electron to each other. Another way of saying that is the intrinsic information of an object consists of its molecular, atomic, nuclear and fundamental matter structure. Any object's intrinsic information is lost in four star collapse stages. And in the following thought experiment, I will take four identical encyclopedias and drop them into the four stars. If I take the encyclopedia and drop it into a white dwarf star, the encyclopedia molecules decompose into atoms and the molecular information is forever lost. If I take the encyclopedia and drop it into a neutron star, the atoms decompose to no neutrons, protons, and electrons, and the atomic structural information is forever lost. If I take the encyclopedia and drop it into a super, super massive quark star matter, the protons and neutrons decompose to up and down quarks, and the nuclear information is forever lost. And if I take an encyclopedia and drop it into a super, super massive black hole energy, the up and down quarks of the encyclopedia will be decomposed or evaporate to super force particle and the fundamental matter information is forever lost. So intrinsic or structural information is lost in a super, super massive quark star matter black hole energy formation and none is emitted as Hawking radiation. As I said, I'm in agreement with his first statement. Baryogenesis is the asymmetrical production of baryons and any baryons in our early universe. And it's expressed by this ratio, eight equals 6.1 times 10 to the minus 10. In my judgment, charge parity and time CPT violation best explains baryogenesis. There are three mutually CPT uh, arguments uh, which uh, support themselves and which agree with my conclusions. The first argument was made by T.D. Lee of Columbia University, a Nobel uh, Physics Prize winner. He said that the CPT theorem is invalid at the Planck scale. What I said was energy mass quantum and Planck cubes, when they collapse to the singularity, they're collapsing to a volume which is smaller than the unit or quantum of energy which I selected, which was the Planck cube. And therefore, in that uh, process, uh, quantum mechanics is invalid. The second argument was proposed by Nick Marvomatis of King's College in uh, London, England. And he basically stated that in highly curved space times, for example, in a super, super massive black hole energy singularity, it violates CPT because of apparent violations in unitarity caused by incoming matter information disappearance. On the previous chart, I basically said that incoming matter information is lost in that super, super massive black hole energy formation, and therefore I am in agreement with Nick Mavromatis. And the third argument was made by Florian Hopke of uh, Hanover University in uh, Germany. 
He stated that there's a quantum mechanics axiom which states the evolution of a system from one quantum state to another must be unitary, and entropy is preserved in unitary dynamics. And what I said was in a super, super mass of quarks storm out of the black hole energy collapsed, the entropy switched for maximum in the super, super mass of quarks storm matter case to minimum in the super, super mass of black hole energy case, so entropy is not preserved. And therefore, CPT, unitary and entropy preservation, were violated in the highly curved space time of both our precursor universe super supermassive black hole and then its white hole big bang energy counterpart. Therefore, there was sufficient CPT violation to produce our universe's variant to photon ratio of 6.1 times 10 to the minus 10th. This is the last chart in the presentation. It's table four primary interrelationships with 20 integrated theories. Uh, six and a half years ago, I started with 20 independent existing theories. They are shown in the first uh, column and in the first row. When I began the analysis, there were no relationships between uh, the two. And the reason for that is there were 20 independent existing theories. But by selectively amplifying and replacing the 20 independent theories, with 20 interrelated amplified theories, I was able to find this relationship and this enormous uh, interrelationship between the 20 theories. And I will summarize the presentation as follows. The Higgs force is related to particle creation because, as I mentioned, particle creation is the process whereby the super force condenses into a matter particle and its associated Higgs force. The Higgs force is related to inflation. One of the amplifications I made is I made inflation time synchronous with particle creation. So at the beginning of inflation, the super force condensed into the heaviest matter particle, the gravitino, and its associated Higgs force. The Higgs force is related to spontaneous symmetry breaking because spontaneous symmetry breaking, by definition, is the condensation of the superforce into a matter particle and its associated Higgs force. The Higgs forces are related to dark matter. Uh, the superforce basically condensed into the photino, which is a dark matter particle, and its associated Higgs force. The Higgs force is related to universe expansions and dark energy. What I said was there were eight permanent matter particles associated with those eight permanent matter particles were eight Higgs forces, and the sum of those eight Higgs forces was dark energy. The dark energy basically provided the universe's expansion from the end of inflation to the present time, which is 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang. And the Higgs forces are related to baryogenesis. What I said there was initially the super force condensed in equal amounts to the up quark and its associated Higgs force and into the anti up quark and its associated Higgs force. Those four particles evaporated back to the super force. And after n of these condensation evaporation cycles, eventually the super force condensed totally into the up quark and its associated Higgs force, and none of the super force energy condensed into the anti up quark and its associated Higgs force. So in summary, by replacing 20 independent existing theories with 20 interrelated amplified theories, a, an integrated theory of everything was created. Thank you.